of Tennessee this week. I'm Blake Stevens. Well, the Great American Outdoors Act passing in the U.S. Senate Wednesday, it aims to address a huge backlog for our national park maintenance while also supporting the Land and Conservation Fund. Now, Senator Lamar Alexander is among the bill's sponsors. Ahead of that vote, I talked with a senator about what he calls the biggest boost to the national parks in 50 years. Let's talk about the uh, Great American Outdoors Act. Uh, I know it includes many things, including cutting that maintenance backlog for our national parks in half. That's something you've championed in previous uh, legislation. Uh, Put simply, what will this mean for the Smokies if it passes? Well, here's what it means for the Smokies. The, the Smokies has $224 million of deferred maintenance. That's uh, <clears throat> worn out trails, <clears throat> roads with potholes, leaky roofs, rundown buildings. To be specific, there's a campground, Look Rock Campground on Chilhowee Mountain that's been closed for five or six years. Uh, because of a sewage system that doesn't work. 5,000 families usually use that. What this bill would do is pay for dealing with half of the Smokies' deferred maintenance over the next five years. Smokies' budget is about $20 million a year. Its deferred maintenance budget is 10 to 12 times that. So all these things wouldn't get done for 15 or 20 years or maybe never without this bill or something like it maybe create some jobs in the process a lot of work uh... well it should create jobs in the process it's also good news for the cherokee national forest a lot of us east tennessees don't realize that the cherokee national forest is actually larger than the smokies and it attracts three million visitors a year uh which is more than many of the western parks do and it has a 27 million dollar backlog so this will help with the roads and the access to that as well as the tennessee wildlife refuge in west tennessee so I noticed the proposal uh, calls for the Land and Water Conservation Fund to be fully funded permanently. What does that mean for the average taxpayer? Well, the, the, all, of, all of this is paid for by energy exploration on federal land. So the idea is you create an environmental burden that's drilling for oil and gas offshore, and you create an environmental benefit that's spend $900 million a year uh, to buy treasured land. For example, Senator Daines in Montana says that 80% of the fishing access lands in, Mo in Montana have been bought by Land and Water Conservation Fund. Okay, so it could stand to benefit. I understand Tennessee has received some of that fund over the years. It stands Tennessee has received a lot of money from the Land and Water Conservation Fund every year. The federal government will get $450 million and the states will get $450 million and Tennessee will get some of that $450 million. For lands like Rocky Fork, which is the new state park up in uh, Upper East Tennessee. All right, and Senator, while I have you, I understand conversations are going on about more coronavirus relief right now. Where are those talks and what type of relief do you support going forward? Well, first we should spend wisely the $3 trillion plus uh, $3 trillion more dollars in credit that we've already spent. Not all of that money has even gone out to the hospitals and to the states yet. One area that I'm particularly interested in is making sure that our public schools, and we have about 1,850 in Tennessee, have enough money to allow uh, children to go back to school in August or September. We just, we want them to do that safely, and that's gonna cost some money for sanitation equipment, for uh, separators uh, between the children when they have meals, for new busing routes, maybe for new classroom space. Everybody wants the children to go back to school, uh, parents, the children themselves, but everybody wants to make sure that's done safely. So the federal government may have to uh, contribute additional funds to help make that possible. That was my next question about school in the fall. I know you and a lot of parents out there want to get students back in the classroom, but um, I, my question was gonna be what's being done to make sure local districts have the resources to reopen safely and what do you say to people worried about a second wave? Well, we're going to have a second wave. There's no doubt about that, but we've got to learn to live with it. And fortunately, uh, what we've discovered is that children are much less affected by COVID-19 than those of us who are, who are older. 
So I think we've learned what it takes. What it takes is staying apart, six feet apart. That's easier to do at the University of Tennessee than it is at Maryville Middle School. Uh, uh, washing your hands a lot uh, and then wearing a mask. Uh, those three things uh, will do more than anything else to keep people safe and allow us to go back to school, back to work, out to eat. I have two final questions here. I hope I don't uh, hold you over. No, I'm uh, right. <clears throat> on the local level, uh, certainly uh, in, in Knoxville and around the state and around the country, there's a lot of conversations going on about police reform after uh, the death of George Floyd. I'm just curious to know if, if there's any types of change that you would support at this time. I know the president just made a, a major uh, announcement from the Rose Garden there. Well, most decisions about policing have to be made locally, but uh, Senator Tim Scott of, of South Carolina has been working with a group of Republican senators to come up with a number of proposals that would give states and local communities more support for training, incentives not to use uh, chokeholds or getting rid of chokeholds entirely, a number of steps that would make it easier for the whole community to, to be involved. Senator Scott himself is African American. And he told me once in a Bible study, and he said I could repeat it, that he was stopped seven times for being a black man in the wrong place in his hometown when he was chairman of the county council of Charleston, South Carolina. So I think a lot of those of us who are white don't know that happens. And what we need to do is to support efforts that can have to come locally that can cause police and communities, including the African-American and other minority communities, to feel comfortable uh, and safe uh, in, in the areas where they live. Well, my last question, Senator, and I, I'm, you may not want to talk about this because you guys are, are going full steam ahead, but you know, you've clocked in more days of public service than any Tennessean, uh, and all of that is, of course, coming to a close later this year. The race for your job is, is uh, getting pretty hot right now, but my question is, uh, as, all, as this year and, and all that it has shaped out to be, have you had a moment to uh, pause and kind of reflect on that all of this is sort of coming to a close. Well, this has been a pretty fast year. Someone asked me the other day, what about ramping down? I said, wait a minute, we've had impeachment of a president, tornadoes and coronavirus so far this year, and who knows what comes next. I consider every single day that I have the opportunity to be a United States Senator a privilege. I know it doesn't look like that sometimes to people from a distance, but it really is. I mean, I get to work on helping to create new medical miracles, helping to take care of the Great Smoky Mountains, helping to create fast new tests so people can tell whether they have COVID-19, and it doesn't always work. But it's a great privilege to be here. So that's what I think about, and whoever is fortunate enough to succeed me, I think will feel the same way after he or she gets here. So no time to sit back and pause and get all sentimental yet? Not at all. Not at all. Not in the middle of impeachment, not in the middle of tornadoes, not in the middle of coronavirus. Well, still to come, our Washington, D.C. Bureau goes one-on-one -on -one with President Donald Trump. What he's saying about the possibility of another stimulus check. You're watching Tennessee This Week on WATE, 6 on your side. Hello, I'm Mike Hatmaker. Whether it's a Wrangler, Grand Cherokee, or Gladiator, are you ready for some summertime fun? Check out these deals. 2014 Ram 4500 cabin chassis diesel, 19,888. 2019 Jeep Grand Cherokee Limiteds, heated and cool seats, Panoramic sunroof, 34,888. 2019 Dodge Caravan SXT, sale price, 18,888. Start your summertime fun today at Jim Call Dodge Chrysler Jeep Ram. When you eat Reese's for dessert, is it over too fast? Well, then chill your Reese's. You'll eat it slower. I wouldn't know. I swallow mine whole. Like a duck. Not sorry. Reese's. Demand more from Longwear. Infallible up to 24-hour fresh wear by L'Oreal Paris. Excellent coverage with no way down. A breathable formula for fresh skin hour after hour. Defies transfer, no excess. Infallible up to 24-hour fresh wear by L'Oreal Paris. What's next? Answers to questions. Jobs, school, lifestyle. So many changes and so many challenges ahead. 
WATE 6 on your side is here as we continue to reopen and reconnect with each other. Reporting on the issues and the impact in East Tennessee, we're working on the answers to what's next. We're with you every step of the way. We are WATE 6 on your side. Hey, welcome back to Tennessee This Week. Will we get another round of stimulus checks to boost the U.S. economy reeling from COVID-19? That's one of the questions our D.C. Bureau reporter Anna Wernicke put to President Trump, speaking one-on-one -on -one with the president in the White House Rose Garden. We're working on something that's going to be very dramatic, very good. President Donald Trump told me in a one-on-one -on -one interview that he's not done with efforts to jumpstart the economy devastated by the coronavirus. I think we are looking at a phase four. Uh, phase one, two, and three have been fantastic for people generally, small business owners also, but we're looking at doing something else in addition. The president says Americans could be receiving a second stimulus check this summer. But as for a second wave of the virus, he says he's not concerned. Because we know how to put it out. President Trump is going full speed ahead, holding his first rally this weekend in Tulsa, despite reports of cases increasing in some states, including Oklahoma. We have over a million requests for tickets. There's never been anything like that. No Nobody's ever heard of such a thing. We talked to the president the day after he met with the families of victims of police brutality. Their whole lives were shattered by what happened. Uh, in most cases, it was a problem with police. And uh, it's just uh, devastating. When you meet with them and you hear the stories, it's devastating. The president said it was important to sign his executive order on police reform. We have great police, great law enforcement. But you have people that make mistakes, and you have some bad ones, too. And the president says he's also on board with the Senate Republican police reform bill unveiled Wednesday morning. Will you support it? Well, I will, and I've looked at it. But he says the fate of further police reform is now up to the Democrats, who have threatened to block the bill in the Senate. Let's see what happens with the Democrats. They want to have... You know, they want to defund, I mean, they literally want to defund our police, and frankly, they would abolish our police if we weren't here. While most Democrats don't want to abolish police, many do want to make it easier to sue officers and police departments for violent acts. We asked the president if, in the midst of nationwide protests over racial injustice, will it be more difficult to unite the country um, in the middle of a re-election campaign? I don't think so. There's a great uh, feeling. I think it's just a great pride in the country. At the White House, I'm Anna Warnicke. Back here in the volunteer state, tensions at the state capitol. Tuesday night, a resolution on the House floor to remember 17 year old Ashanti Posey. A teenager shot and killed. The resolution failing after some lawmakers discussed the circumstances surrounding her death. Police, uh, police have said a marijuana sale happened, but that has not been proven at this time. Well, still to come, we've got a lot to come, including take from our pundits. You're watching Tennessee This Week from WATE 6 on your side. We'll be right back. What is that? Have I been here before? You wouldn't just live with it if they did it. So why live with your dog stressing out during travel? Adaptil is clinically proven to help your dog feel calmer. Find your solution at Adaptil.com. If you've been involved in a wreck with a commercial vehicle, these cases are complex and involve detailed federal regulations. You need an experienced law firm with the resources to fight and a track record of success in handling these types of cases. Call Wettermark Keith, the name to know and trust. Hello, I'm Mike Hatmaker. Whether it's a Wrangler, Grand Cherokee, or Gladiator, are you ready for some summertime fun? Check out these deals. 2019 Dodge Caravan SXT, sale price $18,888. 2020 Honda Civic SI, sale price $24,888. 2018 BMW 330i, sale price $25,888. Some inventory under $6,000. Start your summertime fun today at Jim Call Dodge Chrysler Jeep Ram. You look so handsome tonight. You wouldn't 
wouldn't just live with it if they did it. So why live with your dog stressing out during loud noises? Adaptil is clinically proven to help your dog feel calmer. Find your solution at Adaptil.com. We've got our health care expert, Craig Griffith, our political analyst, George Corda, and our uh, political contributor, Courtney Piper. Hello, uh, pundits. I, I want to start by talking about coronavirus relief. Uh, we heard the president and several other folks at the federal level talk about the possibility of another round of stimulus. Uh, the president, uh, in an interview with um, our D.C. bureau chief, mentioned that uh, stimulus checks could be coming to individuals as soon as this summer. Um, I'm curious from all of you, what should be included in another round of stimulus? Courtney, we'll start with you. Well, I certainly think another round of stimulus is warranted. There were a lot of groups of people and businesses whose business models weren't taken into full consideration in the first three rounds of the stimulus. So I think looking at things like various kinds of payroll tax credits and that sort of thing that can give businesses more liquidity that often rely on extending lines of credit to their customers in order to keep them moving would do a lot to keep our... Uh, continue to dig us out of this recession. We want to look at things that are going to give businesses and all businesses more liquidity and access to capital. Courtney, in your opinion, was it just um, some businesses that maybe fell through the cracks that were left out of the last round of stimulus? Well, look, we can take uh, the examples of restaurants and, and the food supply chain. So everybody heard about how hard hit our restaurants were. Our, our restaurant, our food entrepreneurs were hit really hard. Well, missing from that story was the supply chain behind them, the food service distributors, the folks that deliver those food products to restaurants. Chefs just don't go to Kroger and buy their groceries and, and bring them back every day. Food service distributors often extend restaurant tours, lines of credit to purchase purchase the food that they need, and then they pay them back the next week after they have sold the meals that that food goes in to prepare. So anything we can do to give businesses more um, liquidity and, and access to capital is really going to help us get our economy back on track. Craig, do you see any areas that need relief? Well, there's a lot of areas that need relief, but I don't see much interest in the Senate in ha coming up with another stimulus bill. They're interested in seeing how the money was originally spent in the first uh, three phases of the of the relief and, and that's a valid consideration i mean you had people that didn't need the money getting the money and you had small businesses that were it didn't have the direct banking connections they needed to get sba loans so they were sort of left out of it if you were a, a larger size you, you you could have up to 500 employees and get one of the sba loans so if you had established relationships with a banker and had experience with SBA loans, you went to the top of the heap. So now we're looking at these businesses that didn't have those connections and where they can get some relief. So I, I don't know if the Senate, though, has the stomach for, you know, and, it's, and they're talking, you know, you know, billions and trillions of dollars and, you know, and that's just more debt piled on to an ever-growing debt. Uh, George, I want to get your take on areas you think need uh, more relief. Uh, but I also want to ask you that uh, another relief bill, does that help people politically that support more relief? Well, let me put it this way. It's an election year, and this is a bidding war. This has become a bidding war. The United States of America is going to, when this is all said and done, it's going to be between 25 and $30 trillion in debt. And that doesn't count the unfunded liabilities for things like Medicare and Social Security. What we are ignoring, what we are absolutely positively ignoring is the long-term consequences of this kind of borrowing and this kind of debt. It's not like we've got the money. We don't have the money. This all has to be borrowed. And as a result, there is an inflationary element. There is a... Uh, a national debt element in terms of paying back the interest on this. Now, in the sh in the near term, does all of this money funnel into the economy help to keep it propped up? Absolutely. There's no question about that. But in the long term, is it a positive for the country in terms of how we as a society are going to deal with this astronomical debt? That's a question nobody's willing to face, nobody's willing to talk about, nobody's willing to answer. And that's where we are. 
and that's the reality of it. But with an election five months away, what we've got is how much can I give you and how soon can I get it to you? That's what's going on in Washington. We are the believers, we are the hope keepers, living to make a difference. We are the together, determined to make it better, with every bit of the time we give. We are from the west side, we are from the east side, we are from the south and from the north. Knowing that the change. Welcome back to Tennessee This Week. I'm Madison Keevy. We want to take some time this afternoon to dive deep into what we learned Friday about a change to the Knoxville Police Department use of force policy. Violent encounters between members of the public and police under scrutiny right now. And issues community are coping with in the wake of the death of George Floyd in Minneapolis and other black people at the hands of police. Amid the protests, you may remember, Knoxville Mayor India Kincannon announced she would review KPD's policy. Friday, Mayor Kincannon revealed the results of her review, announcing she would align the department with a campaign known as Eight Can't Wait. That national campaign was created by a nonprofit outlining eight policies police departments can implement to reduce police killings. Those include banning chokeholds and strangleholds, requiring de-escalation, required warning and exhausting of all alternatives before shooting, calling on an officer's duty to intervene, banning shooting at moving vehicles, requiring a use of force continuum, and comprehensive reporting. Now, many of these were already in place at the Knoxville Police Department, and in adopting these eight policies, KPD now bans what's called a bilateral neck restraint, and has added the use of force continuum chart to the policy that was before only used in training. Mayor Kincannon says learning about these policies inspired her to meet with KPD's use of force committee. We're always learning and the community uh, is helping us understand things better, how, th how the policy is perceived and how it's uh, 
enacted in the community are really important. These policies are really important for KPD officers as far as training and understanding uh, how to use de-escalation, how to do crisis intervention, uh, when to use, how to go through the use of force continuum. The changes include a ban on using the once approved bilateral neck restraint and a new requirement to report any time a firearm is pointed directly at a subject, even if a weapon isn't fired. And we're going to have, you know, a more, you know, formal conversation with the public, uh, you know, over the coming months. This is just a, an initial step. Um, and and as, as I've mentioned before, we are having as a country and as a community here locally in Knoxville, uh, a conversation about how we reimagine public safety. So what are we doing as a community, the city of Knoxville and other community partners and other local governments uh, to address those non-emergency needs where you don't, you don't need a police officer to respond, but you might need other kinds of response from a firefighter, from a medic, from a social worker. Addressing those non-emergency needs, a focus for law enforcement leaders too, like the executive director of the Law Enforcement Innovation Center, Rick Scarborough. The numbers are staggering as far as what all law enforcement has to deal with right now, okay? And, uh, you know, we, it's been mentioned, we talked about uh, the defunding of the police and that would, you know, as the answer, and that's not the answer. You can't have less, less policing is not going to be the, going to be the solution. Uh, our social funding needs to be increased, obviously, in the areas of homelessness, uh, opioid abuse. I mean, we have officers carrying Narcan now to try to help in that area. Uh, mental illness, uh, again, we are constantly dealing with mental illness on, out there on the streets today. Scarborough says the best thing law enforcement leaders can do right now is to continue listening to the community and making those needed changes to improve. Another huge development happening late in the week, state lawmakers voting to advance a ban on abortion once a fetal heartbeat is detected. It also requires an ultrasound and the doctor must describe the results and display the image from that ultrasound. The ACLU Center for Reproductive Rights and Planned Parenthood say they're challenging this in court. Meanwhile, the budget debate stretching late into Thursday night ended up with no teacher raises as planned in Governor Lee's proposal. Also no major expansion of sale tax holidays, but local governments will have some extra money to help make up some of the deficits caused by COVID-19. Still, this may not be the end. Friday afternoon, Governor Lee's spokesperson said conversations about the prospect of a special session are ongoing. We'll keep an eye out for developments in the week ahead. That's our time. We hope you'll join us again next Sunday at 1230 for more Tennessee This Week. The views of guests on Tennessee This Week are their own and do not represent the views of WATE6 of your side or Next Star Broadcasting.